I hope from sharing our story or sharing my story that people will see the truth of what happened. There was some injustice that happened and that it seems so heavy handed for what was actually done. In 2014, my husband was serving as a county commissioner and there had been a lot of federal overreach in our community and in the county as a whole. There had been roads that had been closed, grazing allotments were reduced for our ranchers. It was affecting the county and the economic situation there. There was a town hall called and they determined with the people of the community that they were going to have a demonstration because it was far cheaper than litigating. The name of the road was Recapture. It had been closed on a six-month emergency closure, and seven years later, this road was still closed. And what do you do after seven years, after trying to work with the Bureau of Land Management the entire time without results? The very next day, Phil called the BLM and said, I don't like surprises, and I'm sure you don't either. He let them know of their plan to have this demonstration and the date it would be taking place. The week before the demonstration, Phil wanted to ensure total safety and agreement on this, and he spoke with the state BLM director, Juan Palma, and got a recording of him saying, Nobody's going to get arrested, and nobody's going to do all that kind of stuff. We're not going to do that. And I hope it is what you just described you know, that you can have your your celebration and that you can, you know, ride or walk down into the canyon, that'd be wonderful. So the day of the ride came. For the most part, it was kind of a fun ride on some four-wheelers. Went down into the canyon, made it to the end of the road, turned around and came out. It felt like a very positive and peaceful demonstration and I thought that was going to be the end of it. The sheriff and his associates said great job and the BLM actually called and told him that they had done a wonderful job and that they would get to work on that road. Well, five months later we get a call from the Salt Lake Tribune and they said, how do you feel about being federally charged? And my husband said, well, I don't know, I'll have to get back to you. We did not know for another 11 days before we got the certified letter. The charge was misdemeanor, conspiracy to trespass. He called the BLM and said, why? I thought we had an agreement, things were done well, what is the problem? And they let him know that they got a 3,500 signature petition that they wanted something done from some of these outside special interest groups that had been involved in the original closure of the road. And why the BLM would cater to what they wanted was really interesting to us, but this is not something new. They kind of wine and dine, these BLM directors. They're the tail that wags the dog. We are supposed to be protecting the rights of the people, not protecting the rights of the agency. The only reason that I can come up with as to why they would vilify and do this to my husband was to make a public example of him and to intimidate and to put fear into others who may want to stand up and voice their own opinions. There was a national monument that was coming and was soon to be designated 1.9 million acres that would cut off access and affect ranching, mineral exploration. They needed compliance. The BLM and the prosecution had said that there was over $300,000 worth of damage on that road, and that's what they were suing for. We did the study, and it was proved that there was absolutely no damage to the road and that the very idea was spurious. We sat through the jury trial. At one point, they brought in Juan Palma, the state BLM director, they had the tape recording of him saying this, as well as a transcript there. When our defense started to play the tape, the judge called a sidebar and asked, what are you trying to do? And the defense said, we are trying to perjure the witness, Your Honor. And he called a dismissal of the jury and a recess. And when they came back in, they were allowed to tell what had happened but they were not allowed to use the actual recording or the transcript in the trial. They 
the jury was told that they would be given a transcript of his phone call in the jury room, the deliberation room. We were later contacted by two jury members and they were told they asked for that transcript and it was never given to them. And they had concerns about the trial and the way the jury room was handled. As an 18 year old boy walking into that courtroom and I felt very confident knowing that my dad was indeed innocent and thinking that it would be a quick and simple process, especially with all the evidence that we had. And I had faith in the judicial system. As we started going along, I started to notice that they weren't letting my dad present certain evidence. They started to draw it out and focus on things that were totally unrelated to this case that was at hand. And I started to realize that I was naive, that the judicial system is not perfect that they were out to get my dad. And that was just so frustrating to me because it felt like we had all the evidence. How did they not see that he went through all the necessary steps? He called the head of BLM and asked them to walk him through, where can we drive? Where should we stop? And they followed all the rules. At the courthouse on sentencing day, that was the first time I saw my dad's vulnerability in all of this. I even think he got emotional giving his closing statements. And I realized in that moment just how much it had impacted him. And it did. He's stoic. He's brave as brave. But underneath all that armor is a soft, good man who is affected as anybody would be by those kind of experiences. The judge, after Phil spoke, said that he had read the case and he hadn't slept very well the night before. I think there were things about that case he wasn't aware of. And he ended up sentencing Phil to 10 days in federal prison and he was given a $96,000 fine. Now that fine was not for damages, but the judge said that the BLM was required to do a study and that was the cost of the study that we had to repay. I was able to hear the phone calls that my dad made. And oftentimes it was his concern for his roommate or, you know, send money so I can give ramen to this guy and to that guy and put money on this guy's account so he can call his parents. Even in jail, he was just like, I'm not gonna let this experience be anything but great. And that's how my dad does so many things. He's like, I can take something really awful and I can spin it and I can make it a great experience and I can grow from it and that's how he's taught us as kids. That's how he's lived his life. Soon after we went through this experience, Phil ran for the state legislature and won with an overwhelming majority. The U.S. attorney came after him again saying that he needed to pay more in restitution monthly than he had been because he was now making more money. There was a court hearing and they ended up paying the full amount of the fine even though he had made less as a state legislator than a county commissioner. At this point, he felt that this wasn't going away. He thought that this had been put to rest, but for assurance, he felt, I need a pardon. And one night, he texted Senator Mike Lee saying he'd wanted a pardon and would he help. And Senator Lee immediately texted back, yes, 100%, we are doing this, you're on the side of the angels. And Jason Chaffetz was a character reference and aided in securing this pardon for Phil. I remember I was downstairs and I decided to go upstairs and I walked up and my dad, he, had, he was just kind of leaning over the counter, just looking down and I said, Dad, what's up? And he said, Brooke, Jason Chaffetz just called me and my pardon is sitting on Trump's desk right now and he's gonna sign it. And after he said that, he just broke down. I could tell that a weight had been absolutely lifted off of him at that time. You could tell that he was elated, but it wasn't until he said it out loud that it was reality for him. I was ecstatic as well. Um, just very, very happy. I had, I had been there from the beginning to the end, seeing him really in, in his private moments where you could tell that it was weighing very heavily on him. And it was... It was nice to be able to share in his joy and in that weight being lifted. 
I don't want to portray the the image that he was, you know, just suffering, but it was it was hell, you know. <laughs> Today, President Trump granted a full pardon to Philip Lyman. Mr. Lyman's pardon is supported by Senator Mike Lee, former Representative Jason Chaffetz, and other notable members of the Utah community. Lyman is known to be a man of integrity and character who was serving as a county commissioner in Utah when he was subjected to selective prosecution for protesting the Bureau of Land Management's closure of the Recapture Canyon to ATV riders. He had no other criminal history, but he was arrested and sentenced to 10 days in prison and nearly $96,000 and restitution. It was acknowledgement. Somebody was finally looking at this case and saying, what is wrong with this? This is not right. And for it to come from the highest authority, you know, the President of the United States. It just felt like a triumphant end to a really difficult experience for him. And that has been a blessing and it's given us peace of mind. A family friend asked Phil what would make him continue to take that stand and to sacrifice personally for the community the way he had. And he replied, when you're a principled person, the fight will find you. And we found that to be true in so many instances, as I know many people have found as well in their own lives.